I, I begin by praising our creator and fashioner, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and I ask him to send peace and blessings upon all of his prophets and messengers, upon all of us, our families, our loved ones. Uh, I want to join with uh, Bassam in condemning uh, the heinous act of uh, violence against uh, your Marines here on 716. And uh, in the same uh, token, I would like to also condemn uh, the acts of violence con committed by Muslims around the world, whether by ISIS or by anyone else. Uh, well, from my understanding of the Quran and of the Islamic religion, uh, these uh, acts of violence do not fit within my faith. They are contrary to the Quran, and we should have no hesitation in condemning those acts. Hopefully, by the end of my presentation, you will see why I can feel so confident in uh, issuing such a condemnation uh, while at the same time believing in the Quran as the word of God. Uh, Mike, are you hearing some kind of a buzz? Is it too, too loud? Okay, maybe that. How about that? I'll try that. Okay. Uh, so my good friend Mike Lacona here is in the audience uh, with us, so I can count on his help uh, in case I uh, misremember something. Okay. Uh, so to continue then, uh, let me thank uh, David for giving me the opportunity to share this platform with him and uh, Dave for uh, chairing the event uh, for us, uh, John, Brandon, and uh, Ben, uh, all of the people who uh, are working in the background here and making it possible for me to be here uh, with you. Um, now let me get right into the topic then. Is the Quran a book of peace? Now, when we address a topic like this, it's good to have criteria. How do we know, you know, the difference between fish and rotten egg? Well, there has to be some criteria, not only that it does it, how it does it smell, but, you know, does it have gills, for example? We know that one is a fish and the other is not. So how do we know if a book is uh, a book of peace? I don't know of any standard criteria, but we might go by some uh, criteria which we can develop as, as we proceed. But it's good to have a standard criteria developed tonight, which we will use tomorrow night as well, so that we evaluate both the Bible and the Quran based on the same criteria. Now, I would uh, suggest that uh, one criterion is uh, how uh, does the book present its heroes and, uh, and great figures of the past. Uh, nowadays, of course, we're reeling from the news of shooting uh, at uh, a school in Oregon, and uh, we, the statistics are put before us in the news about how often something like this happens, and we wonder what influences our young people. And one of the things that may influence them uh, is the kind of heroes that they look up to, the uh, movie stars, and you know, we know about the violence in movies and video games and so on. We don't know all of the reasons for that, uh, but uh, let, let's think about this as one of the issues. How does a person receive his or her influence? In the case of uh, looking at the Quran, this is even more important for Quranic studies because academic scholars looking at the Quran have tried to look at from a naturalistic point of view, forgetting that the Quran is the word of God, as Muslims believing it to be, just taking it as some piece of literature that developed in history. Historians want to know what were the previous influences. So what they do is they look at the Quranic text and they see that the Quran uh, repeats many of the biblical stories, but the Quran doesn't give you the entire story. The Quran basically basically takes a biblical figure and then uh, gives a new slant on the story to bring out its own moral lesson. The Quran wants to teach something. For example, the Quran wants to teach the belief that there is only one God. So the Quran takes the biblical figures uh, and has them all preaching the same message. There is only one God. Follow this one God. Uh, I am just a prophet and a messenger of God. We don't find this exact speech of the prophets in the Bible, but we find them in the Quran. So historians say that the uh, the, the Quran's author, whom they will presu presume to be the Prophet Muhammad, and whom Muslims believe to be the Almighty God revealing this to Muhammad, the historians will say that this human author, Muhammad, obviously took the stories that he heard around him, but he refashioned the stories to bring out the particular lessons that he wanted to convey. Now that's an interesting conclusion, because when we take that conclusion and we look at the way in which the biblical figures are presented in the Quran, uh, we will see that uh, they are presented as peaceful individuals, or if some violence is known about them uh, previously, that violence is considerably toned down in the Quran. And in fact, some violent individuals are just not simply mentioned at all. 
So if you think about people who are not mentioned at all, a good example would be Samson. He's not mentioned in the Quran. And if you think of people whose uh, violence is considerably toned down, we will have, for example, David and, and Saul. They're mentioned in the Quran, but uh, not as violent as they appear. And I will uh, later on show in what way we can perceive uh, or understand the violence that is actually reported about them in, in the Quran. But uh, in a nutshell, I would say that the most heinous acts known from previously are not reported reported in, in the Quran. So the Quran's readers can look towards these persons as heroes and great figures of the past and not be negatively influenced by uh, atrocities. Uh, in uh, ye yesterday's papers, uh, was it yesterday's? Uh, uh, David uh, Wood, my friend, uh, made reference to Joshua's uh, acts of genocide. Uh, well, Joshua is not mentioned in, by name in the Quran, uh, but uh, commentators see an allusion to him in the 18th chapter of the Quran where the story of Moses is told, and uh, Moses uh, travels with a young companion. So commentators of the Quran say that this must be Joshua, uh, but he's not named. In any case, this story has nothing to do with violence, and uh, those who practice a very high level of uh, spirituality in Islam, known as Sufis, uh, they are attracted to this particular story of, uh, of Moses and his uh, uh, traveling companion. And uh, of course, the Sufis, uh, as you probably know, are entirely non-violent. So well, we, we have again and again examples. Jesus in whom be peace, uh, some violence is known about him in the New Testament, but uh, none of that in the Quran. In fact, in the Quran, he says, Wassalamu alayya Peace be upon me the day I was born, the day I die, and the day I will be raised uh, alive. So uh, uh, the, something about peace is connected with the life of Jesus in the Quranic presentation of him. The Quran insists that the message given to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the Millah of Ibrahim, the religion of Abraham. And uh, some violence is known about Abraham in the book of Genesis where he rescues his uh, nephew Lot uh, from uh, captivity. And uh, uh, of course, uh, one would say that's legitimate violence and Muslims will agree. But that violence is not mentioned about Abraham in the Quranic presentation of him. Uh, so again and again, the violence is being uh, toned down or re removed uh, altogether. Um, as we see in the Quran. So I think that's a very important part of the Quranic uh, uh, presentation and that uh, if you want to know what the author of the Quran is trying to convey, it is really a non-violent message. And this is a sound academic principle in understanding uh, the, the Quran and its message. Now, uh, so that's my first criterion then. How, uh, how does the book present its heroes and, uh, and models? Uh, role models. Uh, second criterion, does the, the book actually insist on peace? Does it give you uh, some uh, instruction and command for peace? Uh, and I'm sure that both, both books will pass this test easily. And of course, uh, many people may be wondering, does the Quran really pass that test? And yes. In the second chapter of the Quran, in the 208th verse, it says so by explicit command, O oh, you who believe, enter into peace completely. The Arabic word there is silm, and some translators have rendered it enter into Islam completely. But the word in Arabic there is not Islam. It is silm, which is close to Islam, but it's not exactly the same word. They both come from the same root, from salam, which means peace. And uh, the, the word silm uh, means, as uh, one of the great uh, grammarians of the Quran, as Zajjaj said in his uh, commentary, uh, it, it's referred, this word is used six times in the Quran altogether, and in each of the six times it refers to musalaha, or uh, reaching a peaceful agreement or settlement or covenant uh, of peace. Uh, so the Quran is telling Muslims, according to this verse, you should enter into peace completely. Uh, so that's my second criterion. The third criterion, I would uh, say, is does the, uh, the book give you uh, a... Uh, a set of uh, precepts that will ensure uh, the, the longevity and establishment of peace in a society. Does it give you laws and, and regulations? As we have now in many of the great countries of the modern world, uh, there has to be a legal system. Uh, without a legal system, everybody claims the right of somebody else. In the book of uh, Judges, it says, uh, reporting on all of the kinds of violence that co were committed in the days of old, in those days, there was no king in the land, so every man did what was right in his own eyes. So 
Are we going to leave it for every man to do what is right in his own eyes? Or are we going to have some temporal leader with a, a set of rules to govern society in a complete system? Uh, it, it, uh, of course, uh, sometimes it's to the embarrassment of Muslims nowadays that some people are trying to implement what they think to be that uh, entire system. Uh, but, but when this system actually did work in the past, it was a comprehensive uh, system governing all areas of life. The difficulty has been that over time, Muslim scholars tended to be traditional, tended to report what was said before by previous scholars. And uh, whereas all of the details were worked out in societies in the past where all of these details fit very nicely, uh, nowadays the details don't fit in our modern uh, society. And uh, we are all reeling from the fact that some people want to re-implement uh, some of the precepts uh, of old. But when we go back to what the Quran actually uh, says, we see that the Quran it gives you just a broad outline. And it's important for us to make a distinction tonight. Our debate is about the Quran. It's not about uh, other aspects of uh, Islamic thinking. But the, the, for my topic here tonight, and for this criterion, my third criterion, uh, the Quran gives you an overview of the kinds of things that are necessary for the society to run properly. You must have laws governing economics, governing politics, governing social behavior, governing family relations, and so on. So all of this is touched upon in, in the Quran. It's not only a, 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 an exhortation to live in peace, but the Quran actually shows you how to live in peace and gives you uh, a set of regulations so that everyone's rights are, are protected and people can actually uh, live in peace. So uh, tomorrow night our topic will be about the Bible and naturally I'll be asking the same question about the Bible. Do we have a comprehensive system uh, in the Bible or uh, would uh, the governing of peace be left to people who uh, are neither Muslims nor Christians or, 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 or they're not believers in God to begin with and we expect them to enforce uh, what we would agree to be uh, peace. So uh, the, my fourth criterion is in the case that war becomes necessary, and we know that uh, wars have been the feature of life from time immemorial, uh, are we going to get rid of war just by you know, snapping our fingers, or is war something here to stay? How do we deal with war? If war should become necessary, uh, does the book subscribe to what we would know today to be uh, the principles of just war? I'd like to just uh, go to my presentation to um, illustrate this topic a little bit more. Now, I have here a, a book entitled uh, When God Says War is Right by uh, Daryl Cole. The subtitle, I don't know if you can read it, it says The Christian's Perspective on When and How to Fight. So this is written from a Christian point of view, but Daryl Cole is going back into Christian history and, and showing how the theory of just war developed over time, starting with St. Ambrose, then get going to St. Augustine, and uh, then St. Thomas Aquinas. So we have Ambrose, Augustine, and Aquinas. It looks like that's three A's, right? And then uh, that work was capped off by uh, Calvin. So now we have three A's and a C. is a good report card to have, right? Okay, so uh, Daryl Cole... Uh, traces the thinking of these great scholars of, of Christianity and shows the kinds of principles that they arrived at over time. Uh, first, there are principles uh, that to be observed before you go into war. What justifies you going into war? He said that there are five principles. One, that war can only be fought by a proper authority. Uh, two, uh, for a just cause. Three, with the right intention. Uh, four, I'm, I'm going to forget the fourth one here, uh, Brother Bassam. Uh, so the, the, uh, who remembers the fourth one? The fourth principle of just war. Uh, it, but uh, that as a last resort. I, I rename it now because Daryl Cole actually puts it as uh, when the war is the only way of righting the wrong. He doesn't like the term last resort because he thinks somebody can always argue that that's not the last resort. You didn't try everything yet. So he re but I'll call it last resort just because this is simple and this is what uh, most people can easily relate to. And it, it, it's the same thing because even if you say that that's the only way of righting the wrong, somebody can always argue with you that some Something else was a solution and you didn't try that yet. So last resort works anyway. And then to continue with Daryl Cole, the last point is that uh, the uh, war, uh, when it is done with all of these, with, by, the, by the legitimate authority, by the, uh, for, the, for the just cause and with the right intention, and uh, as a last uh, uh, resort, then uh, it must uh, be, and, and I, I forget, Bassam, you remember this last point. I'll tell you what's... Uh, no, I will come to the excessive force. Uh, say again? 
sustainable? I, I, I will tell you in a moment if I can get my notes on that. You can pause the time. Stamp. No, that's fine. That's fine. I'll, I'll continue. I will, I, will, I will come back to that point. Then I will tell you. Okay, so uh, those are principles before going into war. And then within the war itself, how do you govern yourself? There are two principles. One is proportionality, and uh, the other is uh, uh, discriminating between combatants and non-combatants. Pro proportionality, obviously, you cannot go fighting uh, more than is necessary. You don't bomb more than is necessary and so on. You calculate the, the pros and cons and the benefits and harms of the actions that you are engaging it within war. And uh, discrimination between uh, uh, combatants and uh, non-combatants, this is essential. And, of course, this is one of the principles principles that are often being violated by Muslim terrorists. They think that they're serving the religious cause, but of course they're not practicing this particular uh, principle. Now, I would say that all of these principles are actually uh, observed in the Quran. And uh, I would ask David, I, I know that David will, will want to bring up this verse or that verse of the Quran. I would ask him to see if that verse can actually fit within these just war principles. And if these uh, verses cannot fit within the just war principles, then of course we'd like to know what they are and then think about what we need to do uh, about these verses that are there in the Quran. But in my reading of the Quran, I find that the Quran actually is uh, uh, for, a, for a just war. It allows for the just war, and these are the principles that it, uh, it gives us over time. Now, as we come to this, I need to go one step further and, and say that this idea of the just war theory has developed further uh, in modern times. And uh, we have here Professor Andrew uh, Wilson, uh, and uh, he has... Uh, uh, put together one of the great courses uh, from the teaching company, put, putting university courses into accessible format for ordinary folks like, folks like, like you and me. And uh, his uh, book and, and course so is with the title Masters of, of War. He gives us the further uh, principle that uh, th there, there is something to be observed as you bring the war to an end. Bringing the war to an end also requires certain principles. There should be repatriation. Uh, the, the, the war should come to a nice close so that at the end, you realize that you have achieved what you started out to achieve. If there was an uh, oppressor to be removed, you've actually removed the oppressor. If there was a harm, you've actually removed the harm. Whatever was the objective of the war is actually now achieved. And uh, if uh, the repatriation needs to be uh, given, that is given. Uh, if somebody needs to be brought to trial, that person is brought to trial and so on. And so we have justice in going into a war, justice during the war, and uh, justice at the end of the war. So the one principle which I had forgotten previously and it now pops into my mind is, is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the war itself, um, it should not be... I thought I had it a moment ago, but <laughs> I'll, I'll come back to you. Okay. I'll come back to you. So uh, we said five principles of just war before going into the war, two principles within the war itself, and some principles which are still loosely defined because scholars are still working on this, uh, what is to be done at the end of the war to bring the war to a nice uh, and round finish. Now, uh, when we look at the Quran today, we must distinguish between uh, what the Quran actually says and what people may say about it afterwards. And one of the things that were said afterwards are things that actually were evolved in Muslim communities. People attributed things back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, things that he may or may not have said, just like people have attributed things to Jesus, and people have written apocryphal, apocryphal Gospels, for example. Uh, now, the, I have with me here a book entitled War and Peace in the World's Religions by uh, Perry uh, schmidt Leukel. Uh, it contains many articles by great scholars, including uh, one by Lord Ridgeon on, on Islam's uh, view of war and peace. And Lloyd Ridgeon points out that the documents that were uh, circulated by Muslims in the early uh, centuries of Islam, and biographies of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, are not necessarily uh, reliable, especially when it comes to matters of war and peace, because the Islamic empire was in an expansionary phase, and that's how the scholars and thinkers at the time saw themselves. They saw that they were expanding, and they, they read that expansion back into the life and teachings of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as if he said all of these things, and if he directed this expansion himself. But these are later developments. We cannot be anachronistic and read this back into the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Now, those biographies are comprised of little bits of information. Just like you go to the Gospel according to Mark, you see that Jesus went here and then he went there. These are two little episodes. So these episodes in the life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, compiled in the biographies, are also compiled separately in other books known as Hadith books. They're massive books, com 
compiling many little episodes. Some of those episodes are reliable, some are not reliable. And even though some Muslim scholars in history have classified cert certain books to be the most reliable books, that does not mean that they themselves considered each and every one of the reports to be absolutely reliable. To this day, we have uh, scholars who are very traditional, uh, who want to follow the way of life of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as it was, and yet they regard some of these individual sayings to be not reliable. So, in, as a general principle, we would say, with Shah Waliullah of Delhi, uh, that uh, the first stop is the Quran. If something is clearly settled in the Quran, you don't get the contrary from some other source. So that's uh, our investigation tonight. What does the Quran actually say about peace? And I would say that the Quran actually does answer that it is a, a book of peace, and this is how I would like to end. And I would not accept a contrary answer from another source. Thank you all very much. Well, good evening. I'd like to thank the University at Tennessee at Chattanooga for hosting our debate tonight. There are many places in the world where an exchange like this would be impossible, and it's becoming increasingly difficult to have open, honest discussions even here in the United States. So I'm glad that the First Amendment is still alive and well in Chattanooga. I'd also like to thank my friend Shabir for coming all the way from Canada to address the concerns of a community so recently ravaged by terrorism. Uh, I met Shabir in 2004 when he came to, um, to Virginia to debate Mike Lacona. Hi, Mike. I, I took Shabir to see The Passion of the Christ that afternoon, and later we headed to the debate. I sat in the audience that night with my best friend, Nabil Qureshi. Um, Nabil and I uh, started hanging out together a few years earlier when our classmates would go out doing things that we had no interest in doing, leaving us to sit around and talk. Uh, Christians and Muslims share many of the same values, and it was my shared values with Nabil that led to our friendship. But the most important value we shared was that we both wanted to go wherever the evidence pointed, even if it hurt. So we didn't shy away from difficult topics. We talked about Jesus. We talked about Muhammad. We talked about the Bible. We talked about the Quran. And our arguments got much more heated than anything you're going to see here tonight. But... Even in the course of our arguments, we always understood that we didn't hate one another. When we were criticizing one another, we didn't assume that this meant that because we argue a lot, we must therefore hate one another. We always understood that we had each other's best interest in mind. And we were determined to get to the truth, and we did. I highly recommend my friend Nabil's book, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. My point here is that Criticism and hatred are not the same thing. When Shabir and I say something critical of something you happen to believe tonight or tomorrow, it's not because we hate you. It's because we respect you enough to be honest and straightforward about our disagreements. But I find myself in a difficult position tonight because tomorrow night we'll be debating whether the Bible is a book of peace. I'm assuming that if I'm really nice to Shabir tonight... <laughs> He's probably going to be really nice to me tomorrow night, but if I take a more aggressive pr approach, he's probably going to return the favor tomorrow. So what's a Christian to do when he looks in front of him and sees the best Muslim debater in the world staring back at him? So at times like this, I recall the advice my dad used to give me. He'd say, son, you're going to walk on thin ice. You might as well dance. <laughs> With this Wood family wisdom in mind, I say to my friend Shabir, Let's dance. <laughs> now, Shabir has given us one version of what Islam teaches, but he and I must be reading the Quran very, very differently. And it's not just the two of us who are reading it differently. Shabir is obviously reading the Quran differently from the way it was read by, um, the way it's read by ISIS or Boko Haram or Al Shabaab or Al Qaeda or the Taliban. And as I'll show in this debate, he's also reading the Quran differently from the way it was read by Muhammad and his companions. So let me explain how I interpret the Quran, and in our rebuttals we can respond to each other and see who's more in line with Orthodox Islam. I'll start at the beginning. The word Islam means submission. In its religious context, it refers to submission to Allah. But Islam doesn't just tell you that you must submit to Allah. It tells you how you must submit to Allah. You submit to Allah by unquestioningly obeying the commands of Allah and Muhammad. 
chapter 33, verse 36 of the Quran. It is not fitting for a believer, man or woman, when a matter has been decided by Allah and his messenger to have any option about their decision. If anyone disobeys Allah and his messenger, he is indeed on a clearly wrong path. When a matter has been decided by Allah and Muhammad, believers have no option but obedience. Chapter 4, verse 65. But know by your Lord, they can have no faith until they make you, Muhammad, judge in all disputes between them and find in themselves no resistance against your decisions and accept them with full submission. Muslims can have no real faith until they make Muhammad their judge in all disputes and have no resistance against Muhammad's decisions. Fortunately, understanding what Allah commands shouldn't be very difficult because Allah claims that his commands are perfectly clear. Chapter 11, verse 1 of the Quran. This is a book whose verses have been made firm and free from imperfection, and then they have been expounded in detail. 12.1, these are verses of the clear book. 15.1, these are the verses of the book and of a Quran that makes things clear. 24.46, certainly we have revealed clear communications. 26.2, these are the verses of the book that makes things clear. 27.1, these are verses of the Quran, a book that makes things clear. 28.2, these are verses of the book that makes things clear. 57.9, he it is who sends down clear communications upon his servant that he may bring you forth from utter darkness into light. Allah, according to the Quran, means exactly what he says. But there's a problem because we go to the Quran and we find verses that seem to be saying different things. Surah 8, verse 61, but if they incline to peace, your enemies, but if they incline to peace, you also incline to it and put your trust in Allah. This sounds like peace is the goal. Then we read chapter 47, verse 35. Be not weary and faint-hearted, crying for peace when you should be uppermost. Here, dominating unbelievers seems to be the goal, and Muslims aren't to seek peace when they are supposed to be uppermost. Now, if Allah's commands are perfectly clear, why do they change from one revelation to the next? The polytheists of Mecca asked this very question, and Allah clarified the matter in... Surah 2, verse 106, whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Do you not know that Allah has power over all things? This verse explains the Islamic doctrine of abrogation. Allah abrogates or cancels certain verses by revealing new verses. So Islam actually has a, a very simple method of Quran interpretation. When you see two verses that are in conflict, the only question you need to ask usually is what, which one came later. With this framework in mind, we're now in a position to understand all of the conflicting verses on peace and violence in the Quran by considering how these verses unfolded during the life of Muhammad. And here we find that jihad proceeds in stages according to the status of Muslims in a society. Let's go through the three stages of jihad. Stage one, when Muhammad and his followers were only a, a tiny minority of the population, they were commanded to preach a message of peace and tolerance. If a Muslim had a disagreement with a polytheist, he was simply to say, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. At this stage, Muslims weren't allowed to fight even in self-defense, even to protect themselves against persecution. What's interesting, however, is that even though Muhammad was outwardly preaching a message of peace and tolerance, behind closed doors, he was already plotting to conquer Arabia and other lands. One day, some of Muhammad's tribesmen went to his uncle, Abu Talib, because they wanted to arrange a truce with Muhammad. They wanted Muhammad to stop criticizing their beliefs and their gods. Watch how Muhammad responds in the history of Atabari. Abu Talib sent for the messenger of Allah, and when he came in, he said, Nephew, here are the sheikhs and nobles of your tribe. They have asked for justice against you, that you should desist from reviling their gods, and they will leave you to your god. Uncle, he said, shall I not summon them to something which is better for them? Then their gods, what do you summon them to, he asked. He replied, I summon them to utter a saying through which the Arabs will submit to them and they will rule over the non-Arabs. Abu Jal said from among the gathering, what is it by your father? We will give you it and ten like it. He, Muhammad, answered that you should say there is no God but Allah. 
Muhammad tells his tribe, become Muslims and we'll rule over the Arabs and the non-Arabs. We can use the Shahada, there is no God but Allah, to make people submit. Why is Muhammad walking around Mecca preaching a message of peace and tolerance, but behind closed doors he's plotting to conquer? Allah later clears this up in chapter 3, verse 28 of the Quran. Let not the believers take disbelievers for their friends in preference to believers. Whoso doeth that hath no connection with Allah, unless it be that you but guard yourselves against them, taking, as it were, security. Don't be friends with non-Muslims unless it's to guard yourselves against them. Ibn Kathir, the most respected Muslim commentator of all time, explains the meaning of this verse as follows. Unless you indeed fear a danger from them, meaning except those believers who in some areas or times fear for their safety from the disbelievers. In this case, such believers are allowed to show friendship to the disbelievers outwardly, but never inwardly. For instance, Abu Qari recorded that Abu Ad-Darda said, we smile in the face of some people, although our hearts curse them. Abu Qari said that Al-Hasan said, Takiya is allowed until the day of resurrection. Here we have the doctrine of Takiya, which takes different forms in different situations, but in this context refers to Muhammad and his companions pretending to be friendly towards the disbelievers in order to protect the Muslim community while Muhammad plotted to conquer and subjugate the unbelievers. Stage two, when Muhammad had gained a larger following and had formed alliances with various tribes, but wasn't yet strong enough to subjugate the unbelievers, he was ordered to wage defensive jihad. At this stage, Muslims are allowed to fight the unbelievers, but the unbelievers have to do something first. The unbelievers have to start it. A characteristic passage is Surah 2, verses 190 to 193. And fight in the way of Allah with those who fight with you. And do not exceed the limits. Surely Allah, Allah does not love those who exceed the limits and kill them wherever you find them, and drive them out from whence they drove you out. And persecution is severer than slaughter. And do not fight with them at the sacred mosque until they fight with you in it. But if they do fight you, then slay them, such is the recompense of the unbelievers. But if they desist, then surely Allah is forgiving, merciful. And fight with them until there is no persecution, and religion should be only for Allah. But if they desist, then there should be no hostility except against the oppressors. So there's fighting in stage two, but the fighting is a response to persecution or oppression or even criticism. Many Muslims in the West insist that this is the end of the story. Fighting is self-defense. But the revelations continue to change as the Muslim community expanded. Stage three. When Muhammad and his followers became the most powerful force in Arabia, they were commanded to wage offensive jihad, violently subjugating unbelievers simply for being unbelievers. Surah 9, verse 29 of the Quran commands Muslims to fight those who believe not in Allah. Notice this doesn't say fight those who fight you. That was stage two. This verse tells Muslims to fight people based on their beliefs. Surah 9, verse 73. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. Notice, strive hard against whom? Against oppressors? Against persecutors? No, strive hard against the unbelievers, non-Muslims, and hypocrites, people who claim to be following Muhammad but aren't really following his commands. Chapter 9, verse 23. O you who believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. 48, 29. Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, and those who are with him are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves. The distinction in these verses is not between people who are attacking you and people who aren't attacking you. The distinction here is between believers and unbelievers, and Muslims are told, only show mercy towards fellow believers. Now, the most common response to passages like this is the context defense. Surely, you must be taking these verses out of context. Well, let's look at the context of one of these commands. Generally, when we're referring to the context of a Quran verse, we either mean the historical context, what was happening when the verse was revealed, or the literary context, what, what do the verses in the surrounding passages say? Ibn Kathir gives us the historical context. After Muhammad conquered Mecca, he eventually told the polytheists of Arabia that they could no longer take the religious pilgrimage to Mecca, which they'd been doing for centuries. Members of Muhammad's tribe, the Quraysh, were upset because 
they had they earned a lot of money from their dealings with the with the polytheists. Here's what happened. Allah Most High ordered the believers to prohibit the disbelievers from entering or coming near the sacred mosque. On that, the Quraysh, Muhammad's tribe, thought that this would reduce their profits from trade. Therefore, Allah, Most High, compensated them and ordered them to fight the people of the book until they embrace Islam or pay the jizya. He then quotes chapter uh, 9, verses 28 to 29. Therefore, the messenger of Allah decided to fight the Romans in order to call them to Islam. According to the historical context, Surah 9, verse 29, fight those who believe not in Allah, was revealed because Muhammad's tribe were wondering how they were going to make money. And after receiving this revelation, Muhammad decided to fight the Romans until they, uh, uh, to invite them to Islam. If the Romans converted, they would pay zakat. If they didn't convert, they would pay jizya. Either way, through fighting them, revenue would come to the Meccans. That's the historical context. What about the literary context? We'll see if we can find something peaceful here. The passage begins in verse 28 and continues through verse 33. I'll try and squeeze it all in. We'll read the entire passage. Verse 28. O oh, you who believe, truly the pagans are unclean. So let them not, after the, this year of theirs, approach the sacred mosque. And if you fear poverty, soon will Allah enrich you, if he wills, out of his bounty. For Allah is all-knowing, all-wise. How is Allah going to enrich them? Next verse, fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. But why fight Jews and Christians? Aren't we believers too? Next verse, and the Jews say Ezra is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before. Allah's curse be upon them how they are turned away. So Jews and Christians aren't real monotheists. We're unbelievers as well. Have we done anything else? Next verse. They took their rabbis and their monks to be their lords besides Allah and Christ the son of Mary. Yet they were commanded to worship but one God. There is no God but he. Praise and glory to him far as he from having the partners they associate with him. Any other reason to fight us? Next verse. They desire to put out the light of Allah with their mouths. Notice it says with our mouths. This is talking about what we say, what we preach, not us attacking the Muslim community with an army. But Allah will not allow but that his light should be perfected, even though the unbelievers may detest it. Allah won't allow Jews and Christians to spread our false beliefs through preaching. But how's Allah going to stop us? Next verse. It is he who hath sent his messenger. Muhammad, with guidance and the religion of truth, Islam, to prevail it over all religion, even though the idolaters may detest it. How is Allah going to prevail? Surah 9, verse 29. Fight those who believe not in Allah till they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. Now, that's the entire passage. Where's the part about self-defense? Where's one word about self-defense? Every criterion for fighting Jews and Christians in this passage has to do with what we believe. If Allah means to say, only fight people who are attacking you, this is a very strange way of saying it. And if he says, fight those who believe not in Allah, when he really means fight in self-defense, he most certainly is not the perfectly clear communicator he claims to be. Putting all of this together, Islam means submission. You submit to Allah by unquestioningly obeying the commands of Allah and Muhammad. Allah claims that his commands are perfectly clear. Later revelations abrogate earlier revelations, so bringing up peaceful verses doesn't work if they've been abrogated. And Muhammad couldn't hope to win a physical confrontation with the unbelievers. He promoted peace and tolerance outwardly while plotting in secret to conquer the unbelievers. When his numbers increased, he began fighting the unbelievers, but only defensively. And when he became the most powerful force in Arabia, he began subjugating the unbelievers. Now, what I find most fascinating about all of this is you can pick any country in the world and it will follow this pattern, the pattern laid down by Muhammad. In countries like the United States, where Muslims make up about 1% of the population, the message of Islam is peace and tolerance. In places of the world where Muslims make up 20, 30% of the population, so they're strong enough to fight but not strong enough to dominate the unbelievers, the message of Islam is if you criticize us or do something, you're going to get some sort of violent reaction, defensive jihad. In places like Saudi Arabia or Pakistan, where Muslims are the strongest force, unbelievers are violently oppressed, 
or at the very least, they are second-class citizens. Now, just so, what, just so no one misunderstands me here, I am only talking about what Islam teaches and how these teachings tend to surface in various ways around the world. I'm not talking about what individual Muslims believe. Muslims are as diverse as any other religious group in the world, and so when your Muslim friend tells you that Islam is a religion of peace, he or she probably believes it. But our topic tonight is not, what do your Muslim friends believe? Our topic is, is the Quran a book of peace? And I don't see how a book that calls for the ongoing violent subjugation of unbelievers can be a book of peace. Thank you, Dr. Wood. So welcome back, those of you who have prayed. Uh, I hope you prayed for all of us. And I pray that God will accept uh, your prayers on behalf of all of us. Uh, now, for my 12-minute uh, rebuttal, uh, let me uh, remind you of uh, where I began. I, I said that we need to have criteria. Otherwise, it's anybody's bias. I don't like your book. I don't like your nose. Your nose is too long, too short, too flat, and too pointed, or whatever. But we need to have some criteria. How do we know if a book is a book of peace? And we need to apply the same criteria to both books. David is right. We have to dance. Well, let's, uh, I mean, the dance continues until tomorrow. So my four criteria, one, is how does the book present its heroes? And uh, I've said this is important in the case of the Quran because historians of religion want to know what were the influences that shaped the Quran as a literary product. Forget that it's the word of God. And from a historical point of view, they say that the, the Muhammad took the stories of old, from the Bible especially, and uh, refashioned those stories to bring out the particular lessons he wanted to bring out. So my question to uh, us now tonight is, why do those stories have these biblical figures appearing to be very peaceful. That shows that the Quran means to be a peaceful book and to influence its readers towards peace, not towards uh, violence. Second, does the book offer a, a direct command? And we have seen that it actually does in Surah 2, verse 108, uh, for example. And then, uh, what about the legal uh, system? This is uh, verse number 208. What about the legal system? That was my third criterion. Uh, does it just simply preach to you, okay, be peaceful, but how are you going to be, be, be peaceful in a society unless you have a polity that is going to bring people together to live in peace? To me, the Quran actually does that. It, it is a, it, it, the, the regrettable part is that uh, Muslim scholars over the centuries have not allowed that polity to develop to, uh, to address modern concerns. And Muslim believers are, are reeling under the pressure from uh, laws which were framed a long time ago but do not address their real needs in present times. And non-Muslims looking at some Muslims trying to apply some arcane laws are, are asking, is this really your Islam? Well, if that's it, I, I don't want Islam. I don't want your Sharia or any uh, law. But uh, we, we recognize that any modern state has to be governed by a legal system. And the question is, does the book present a legal system that will allow people to live together in peace. And my fourth criterion was about just war principles. And uh, I'll uh, just mention the one thing that I'd forgotten previously, that there should be a reasonable hope for success. If you're going to enter into a war, uh, you must foresee that this is going to end up with success. Otherwise, you're going to waste the lives of your soldiers, and you're going to waste the lives of the other people. And in the end, you still have the original problem that you're dealing with, so the war becomes pointless. I wish that some uh, Muslims and others had remembered this, like the ISIS, for example. Do they have a reason? hope of success or do, are they living under delusions of grandeur? Sometimes we wish that some modern governments had planned carefully before they enter into wars and find themselves in a quagmire. Our soldiers are there, they cannot get out, but they're dying and the body bags are coming back. So uh, does the war have, uh, do you have a reasonable hope of success before entering into the war? These are just war principles that I talked about. Principles before entering into a war, principles of conduct within the war, and uh, uh, principles to be observed as you bring the war to a close, to make sure that the war is not going to suddenly pop back into existence and you have the problem all over again. You have dealt with the problem effectively that you wanted to deal with uh, in the first place. Uh, my contention was that all of the verses of the Quran will actually fall within just war principles. And, and that shows that uh, the Quran still is a book of peace, even though it allows for war, but it is allowing for a just war. I don't think that in anything David said, uh, he actually proved that any verse of the Quran actually falls outside of these principles. What I find is that David has picked some of the verses that will actually have most emotional effect, and he has tried to paint the Quran to be a very violent book without an overall historical framework within which to examine how these verses came into being as they are. So I will give you a framework. 
Now, uh, from a Muslim point of view, this is the word of God, and all of this is coming from divine wisdom. Let's put that point of view aside for the moment and look at the matter from a historical point of view. Uh, historians, for example, William Montgom Montgomery Watt, will not uh, say that all of these hadith uh, reports about what the Prophet, peace be upon him, said and did and approved, that these are all authentic. Uh, in fact, there's been a long history in academia of saying that the hadiths are not authentic. And on the other hand, Muslims who want to preserve their traditional way of life and, and, their, and their belief system have been insisting, no, the hadiths are uh, as they are. We have books collected, the hadiths are in there, they're authentic. So we have two extremes. Academia on the one hand, modern uh, non-Muslim orientalist scholars studying uh, the religions of the Middle East and, and, and Eastern countries more generally. Uh, and on the other hand, the Muslims defending their faith and saying, no, it's all authentic. They're saying, no, it's not authentic. These are saying, not authentic. In between, we have some uh, Orientalist scholars such as Harold Motsky, and I just mentioned the name William Montgomery Watt, who take a middle position and say that some are authentic, some are not authentic. We need to have some criteria for deciding what are authentic and what are not. Now, I want to know, where does David fit within this spectrum? If he's a Muslim, he might say, and I would understand, some Muslims do say that I disagree with them, they'll say it's all authentic. So he's saying, okay, it's all authentic. Uh, that hadith says so, and the Prophet was planning this. Bukhari said so, Ibn Kathir said so. That's all authentic. Our scholars are right because he's speaking as a Muslim. If he's speaking uh, as a non-Muslim, I expect him to either come to the middle position with some of the Orientalist scholars or to the other extreme with some of the other Orientalist scholars and say we don't accept any of these hadiths. Uh, Noel Deck, for example, said that the Quran we accept to be authentic as a record of what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said and did, but not the other uh, later materials. So the Quran, we, we Muslims believe, was recorded, put into writing very soon after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But by contrast, even Muslims say the books of Hadith and the Sirah, the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and the history books. Like David was quoting a book by a man named Tabari who died in the year 310 uh, of the Muslim era, and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, died in the year 11. So this other man uh, was writing a, a few hundred years, uh, at least 200 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So David is quoting that man's words as if those are authentic. So where does he stand? Does he stand as a Muslim saying, yeah, those are our scholars, we believe them? Or does he stand with the non-Muslim scholars and which group? Uh, other, if he does not identify where he stands, it looks like he's just picking and choosing and just throwing anything uh, for emotional uh, effect. Uh, so too with uh, the idea of abrogation. He's attributing this to the Quran because he can cite a verse, the second chapter of the Quran, the 106th verse. But uh, uh, scholars have looked at that verse and said that even though Muslim scholars have read that verse and said that this is about abrogation, uh, it, it, this verse does not actually mean that verses of the Quran abrogate each other. Let me explain the, the concept. What David is saying is, look, there are verses of the Quran which seem peaceful. That looks like stage one. There are verses which say fight in self-defense. That looks like stage two. Then there are verses which say go and uh, you know, take over the enemy. That's stage three. So how do we go from stage one to stage two to stage three? Did God give different instructions? The Muslim scholars, actually, some Muslim scholars will agree with him, some classical scholars. But, but then, uh, is David citing them as his scholars? Uh, whereas, on the other hand, some non-Muslim scholars, for example, John Burton, uh, says that this is not an idea of abrogation. It's not that the verses are giving you one instruction, repealing it with a later instruction, uh, such that one verse of the Quran cancels out another verse. He says that the, the Quran, speaking of abrogation in Surah 2, verse 106, the very verse that David cited, is actually speaking about the Quran abrogating previous revelations meaning that the, uh, God has previously sent messages to previous prophets, to Moses, to, uh, to uh, David, to Jesus, and now God has finally sent a message to the Prophet Muhammad, and it is this final message which Muslims are required to follow today. So this final message repeals the others. Of course, the moral code will remain the same, the basic beliefs will remain the same, but there could be specific dispensations. Uh, suitable to certain times and climes, and now God has given us his final instructions for these times, so this is what we follow. Now, if we uh, uh, now understand the Quran in this way, that the Quran is a document by itself, that's what our topic is. Our co topic is not all of Islam and everything that Muslim scholars have said. It is, uh, in that uh, note, interesting that uh, some of the final words that David said in his uh, conclusion, I noted down, he said something to, uh, close to these words, I am only talking about what Islam teaches. 
I'm only talking about what Islam teaches. That means it's off topic. Because our topic is not what Islam teaches. Our topic is, is the Quran a book of peace? It is possible that the Quran teaches one thing, and Muslims may have evolved their faith to teach something else. And, and, and there could be many things called Islam. Why, why should we think that there's only one Islam? As if there is one person in the world named Islam, and then he speaks, and then we know what he says. Uh, there are many people uh, following what they call to be a religion of Islam, and there are many different followings, many people teaching different things. So you cannot just simply with a, a single brush paint all uh, of Islam in the same way. And in any case, that is not uh, our topic. So he says when Muhammad became a powerful force, that is when he began to dominate the enemy, or there are verses in the Quran which preach dominance. But if you put that in the framework of just war principles, even if he was right, then you would see that, in fact, just war principles actually prescribe something like this, that if you are weak, that Sun Tzu said this actually very, you know, a, a thousand years before the Prophet Muhammad, ancient Chinese uh, militarist, uh, in his book Art of War, which today is studied in business circles uh, and the strategies are, uh, you know, we didn't realize that business people are going to war with us for our money, but, you know, they're doing this. Uh, <laughs> So if, if you're weak, then you practice other tactics. And if you're strong, then you do something that, that is consonant with that strength. But that does not mean that you can do something unjust. And there's nothing in the Quran that prescribes that you can do something unjust. In fact, quite, quite the contrary. The Quran stands for justice and tells us that all of the prophets of God were sent by God in order to institute justice. So that's the bottom line, justice. But if you have power, then you have the responsibility to protect using that power. You cannot uh, be idle and let some people be oppressed. The Quran in the fourth chapter in the 75th verse actually speaks specifically about this. So when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his uh, first followers were in the Prophet's hometown, uh, they were weak and downtrodden. They could not respond. They were being beaten and oppressed. But when they moved away and formed a separate polity and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was accepted as the head of state in a new city, that is when he had the responsibility to protect his own citizens and also the oppressed people everywhere. So naturally, the, the modus operandi changes, but the original principle does not change, the original principle of justice and mercy and kindness. So we cannot uh, then take uh, what people have said over time. Muslim scholars have interpreted it in their own way. Now we have to look at it in an academic and unbiased fashion, and then we see that the Quran emerges as a book of peace. Thank you. Good. Well, thank you, Shabir. And uh, I think the debate so far is an excellent uh, demonstration of the different methods of interpreting Islam. On the one hand, we have the traditional Islamic method of interpreting the Quran, and we have the new Western method of interpreting the Quran. The traditional method of interpreting the Quran is based on the idea that Allah means what he says. Allah tells you what to believe. You don't tell Allah what he actually means. The Western method of interpreting the Quran is based on going through the Quran, finding passages that somehow agree or can be interpreted to agree with Western values, and then using those to reinterpret all of the passages that call for uh, violence or subjugation. Now, Shabir brings up his criteria. He says that the Quran presents biblical figures as peaceful figures. Well, the, the more peaceful the Quran pre presents biblical figures, the, more, the, the, the worse the contrast between them and Muhammad, because as we've seen, Muhammad eventually called for the violent subjugation of unbelievers for being unbelievers. He asks, does the Quran have a direct command about peace and violence? Yes, the Quran has commands about peace and violence, but as I pointed out, those commands depend on the status of Muslims in a society, and the violent passages come about when Muslims are in a position to dominate unbelievers. He says, do these commands fall into a just war theory. No, fighting unbelievers, specifically for being unbelievers, based on their beliefs as Jew or Christian, does not fall into just war theory. Shabir says that I've picked verses that have an intended, uh, my, a, a desired emotional impact, that I'm picking out very bad verses of the Quran. Actually, I quoted, Quran, I, I quoted peaceful and violent Quran verses to show the different roles that these verses play uh, based on the status of Muslims in a society. So I, put, I drew attention to peaceful verses of the Quran, which apply in those kinds of situations. When I quote the violent passages, that's because those are the final marching orders of the Quran. There's nothing absurd if we're asking, 
whether the Quran is a book of peace to ask what are the final marching orders? What is its final message about how people are, what people are supposed to do? And that's very important. If the Quran for a thousand pages called for nothing but peace and tolerance and on the last page said, by the way, fight everyone who disagrees with you, that wouldn't be a book of peace, right? Those are the final marching orders. And so when we look at the final marching orders of the Quran, and chapter 9 was the last major surah of the Quran revealed, and what do we find when we look at the last major surah of the Quran revealed? Fight those who do not believe in Allah. Fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you and let them find in you hardness. O prophet, strive hard against the unbelievers and the hypocrites and be unyielding to them. If you want to reinterpret those, you have to say Allah is just not very clear. But Allah repeatedly says he's, he's clear. So, uh, so you have to pick one, but uh, you can't have both Allah claiming to be clear and these verses meaning something radically different from what they're saying. Shabir says that we need criteria for distinguishing between authentic and non-authentic Muslim traditions and... Um, if, if, you, if you recall what I did, almost every passage I quoted was from the Quran, wasn't it? Because that's a topic. The only time I quoted non-Quranic sources was when I quoted what the Quran says, I pointed out what it obviously means, and then I quoted Islam's most trusted, most trusted uh, commentator on the Quran to show that he agrees with my interpretation of the Quran. So I didn't just quote them and, and he's saying something that totally contradicts the Quran. I quoted the Quran, showed what the Quran says, and then I quoted... Uh, I quoted Ibn Kathir as support. Say this, he agrees that it means exactly what I'm saying. It means just to show that I'm, I'm not just inventing my interpretations as I go along. So I, I didn't quote many sources outside of the Quran. I, I believe I quoted Ibn Kathir twice. I don't remember if I quoted anything else. But uh, if Shabir wants to distinguish uh, true sources from, uh, from non-authentic sources, well, Muth Muslims have methods for, for doing that. Right? They have hadith criticism. But when we apply the methods of hadith criticism to distinguish true sayings of Muhammad from unreliable sayings of Muhammad, this doesn't help. These criteria do not help because you end up with passages which are deemed authentic by Muslim scholars, by hadith uh, scholars, and you end up with passages like Muhammad saying in Sahih al-Bukhari 69.24, I've been commanded to fight people until they say la ilaha illallah. I've been commanded to, be, I've been commanded to fight people until they become Muslims. Now, here again, if you want to interpret that in some other way, which, by the way, lines up perfectly with what the Quran says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, what are you going to do? How do you, how do you reinterpret that? Let, let me put it this way. If Allah says, fight those who do not believe in Allah, when he really means fight in self-defense, and Muhammad says, I've been commanded to fight against people till they say there's no God but Allah, and he actually means fight people in self-defense, these are not very good communicators we're dealing with. These are, these are disturbingly bad communicators. And I just have to point out that it seems like I have more respect for the clarity of Allah's statements and of Muhammad's statements than many Muslims. Another passage, Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, that is authentic by Muslim criteria of hadith. And here, don't take these as independent, just, fit, uh, just with what the Quran's going along with what the Quran says to, sh to show that Muhammad agrees with my interpretation. Sahih al-Bukhari 2797, Muhammad says, by him in whose hand my soul is, I would love to be martyred in Allah's cause and then come back to life and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred and then come back to life again and then get martyred. Shabir, Shabir can, can throw out this passage all he wants, but my point is, when Allah says that you have to unquestioningly obey him, and then he says his commands are perfectly clear, and then he tells you, fight those who do not believe in Allah. How am I supposed to interpret that? I interpret it as, okay, if I'm in a situation, so this wouldn't apply to Muslims in the West, but if I'm in a situation where Muslims are the strongest force, then I have to violently subjugate unbelievers. And that's how Muhammad interprets it. That's how Islam's greatest, inter greatest interpret interpreters of all time interpreted it. So who are we in the 21st century to say, no, that's not what Allah meant, even though he says he's perfectly clear. Muhammad, he didn't understand what Allah really meant, even though, according to Islam, Muhammad is the greatest interpreter of the Quran, and, Islamics, and Islam's greatest scholars of all time got this wrong. If, if, that's your, if, if that's the method, we can interpret anything to mean anything we want. Now, Shabir says that Muhammad had different obligations when he became a leader. I know, that's, that's exactly my point. When he became a leader, the methods entirely changed, and that's when you get the revelations, fight those who do not believe in Allah. So if that's, 
if that's Muhammad's job, when he gets in a position of leadership, why are any other Muslims around the world wrong when, the, when they get in a position of leadership and authority to subjugate unbelievers? That's what, that's what Muhammad said he was supposed to do in that situation. Now, Shabir makes a couple of uh, interesting claims. He says that the, the abrogation verses in the Quran refer to the abrogation of previous scriptures, not, not to certain verses of the Quran abrogating other verses of the Quran. Uh, but this interpretation, I, I would say, is, is impossible if we, if, we have, if we have any consideration for what Muhammad's companions and others said about them. Uh, he cites John Burton, 20th century British Orientalist, to defend his claim. Um, if I'm trying to discover what an Islamic doctrine means, I, I prefer going with actual Islamic scholars, uh, not 20th century um, British revisionists. So let's look at the passages. Chapter 16, verse 101 of the Quran, Allah says, And when we change one communication for another communication, and Allah knows best what he reveals, they say, you are only a forger. Nay, most of them do not know. So, Muhammad's being accused of being a forger for changing something. And Shabir says, well, that's because he's changing the, the revelation. First of all, that would be impossible. I mean, these are the pagans of Mecca who are accusing him of being a forger. If it's for changing something in previous revelation, they didn't know enough about the Torah and the gospel to accuse Muhammad of forgery for contradicting something in the Torah and the gospel. Uh, but apart from that, we, just, we know the historical context here. This is uh, al-Wahidi. He actually gives the historical background. This verse was revealed when the idolaters said, Muhammad is mocking his companions. One day he commands them to do something, and the next day he forbids them from doing it, or brings instead something which is easier. He is nothing but a forger who says things of his own invention. So the historical background is, Muhammad, I mean, the, the polytheists are accusing Muhammad of changing his revelations. And we find the same thing with Surah 2, verse 106. Uh, when whatever communications we abrogate or cause to, cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. The uh, commentary, according to Muhammad's cousin, Ibn Abbas, I would assume that he has an idea of what it meant. Ibn Abbas says, then Allah mentions what was abrogated of the Quran and that which was not abrogated as a direct reference to the claim of the Quraysh, Muhammad's tribe, who said, that the, who said to the prophet, O Muhammad, why do you command us to do something and then forbid it? So if we look at the verses, the verses sound like they're saying something about Muhammad changing his revelations. We look at the commentaries. The commentaries tell us exactly. Muhammad's companions tell us what. And by the way, since Shabir wants to distinguish authentic from non-authentic traditions, you can go to Islam's most trusted sources in Sahih al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. They're filled with passages about one verse of the Quran abrogating another verse. So wherever we go, we come down on the side of Quran verses abrogating other Quran verses. And what... Why would we ever go against it? Because John Burton says so? Interesting. Shabir made an argument that the word silm means Islam. And let's go ahead and read the verse, chapter 2, verse 108. I mean, chapter 2, verse 208. O you who believe, enter completely into Islam and do not follow the footsteps of Satan. Surely he is your open enemy. Let me give some translations here. Shabir says this should read, enter completely into peace. Well, let's go through some translations. Pickfall. Come, all of you, into submission. Yusuf Ali, enter into Islam wholeheartedly. Hilali Khan, enter perfectly in Islam. Shakir, enter into submission, one and all. Sher Ali, enter, uh, come to submission, all of you. Khalifa, you shall enter, uh, you shall embrace total submission. They're translating it as Islam and submission. Why would they do that? Well, we, kn we know what the historical background of this verse is. A Jew converted to Islam. His name was Abdullah ibn Salam. He converted to Islam, but he still kept Jewish dietary restrictions and the Jewish Sabbath. And this was reported to Muhammad that this Jewish convert was continuing to keep the Jewish rituals. And this verse was revealed as a response, enter completely into Islam. Notice, enter completely into peace would make no sense. The guy's not accused of being violent. He's accused of not entering completely into Islam, still maintaining Jewish practices. So the historical context shows that this actually means what it says enter completely into Islam or into submission. But now, that's what Shabir was basing his reinterpretation of the Quran on, that this says, enter completely into peace, so the Quran must be very peaceful. Well, it doesn't mean that, and so we're left with verses of the Quran abrogating other verses. We know that's the historical context. So verses of the Quran abrogate other verses. Well, that means the peaceful verses, which come earlier in the life of Muhammad, are abrogated or canceled by the final marching orders, which call for violently subjugating unbelievers. So is the Quran a book of peace? I'd say no.
Yeah, so interesting interchange. Uh, so David has his views, I have mine. It's good that we can talk about it uh, in, in a civil manner and look at reason, evidence, and proof. Now, the last point David made was uh, about the translation of the uh, second chapter of the Quran, the verse number 208, which I said means enter into peace completely. Uh, notice what my evidence for that translation was. My evidence was an ancient grammarian who died in the year 311. I'm talking about the original Arabic. Now, David is citing a number of translations. Uh, I know this has been, become a common interpretation among Muslims. They think that this verse says, enter into Islam completely. It's an ancient uh, uh, commentary, uh, but it's not necessarily the original text. The original text is still there before us, and it still says silm, which means, as, as Zajjad said, it means musalaha. Everywhere it's re re mentioned in the Quran, six times altogether, it always means the same thing. You put Islam in the other places, just won't work. So that's the, the text, and uh, I, I, I don't think we can go by the English translations. We have to go by the original Arabic. Now, he, David is saying that there are so many passages in Bukhari and Muslim, these are hadiths, which say that some verse of the Quran has abrogated some others. But to anyone who does a careful study of this, not only John Burton, but even a scholar like Muhammad Khalil, writing an article in Contemporary Approaches to Islam, it's a, it's a modern book. But nevertheless, people like myself, we go back through and we see why did Muslims think at one time that one verse of the Quran abrogates another one? Did they have something that reliably is traced back to the Prophet Muhammad, on whom be peace, that he said, that some verse uh, cancels some other one or abrogated another one. And when we trace these reports carefully, we realize that uh, this is an idea that emerged among early Muslims, that some verses cancel some others, but it's not a reality. The Quran, as Taha Jabir al-Alwani has pointed out, is revealed in an absolute sense. This is the word of God. Now, you cannot let some other report by somebody else lead you to believe that one of the verses is now canceled. It's like you have the book, you're saying, okay, this is the word of God, I read this, oh, this is what God is saying to me. And somebody says to you, oh, you know that? That one is canceled. So, like, what authority does he have to tell you that somebody has canceled the word of God? So we have to get that on, on, on authority that is equal to the authority of the Quran itself, which Muslims have confidence has been uh, reliably transmitted by uh, memory and also uh, by... Uh, by in writing. Uh, so with that confidence in the Quran, a, a Muslim would not be on good ground to accept some report that says that the verse of the Quran is no longer applicable and we must follow something else. So when John Burton say, it proves that in a, in a very systematic and academic fashion, a person like me gravitates to his work because we see that this man knows what we are also discovering for uh, our and in fact, John Burton is not just some individual. He has actually emerged as the known expert in academic circles on the question of whether or not verses of the Quran abrogate each other. So in short, uh, those like ISIS and others who want to say, okay, we are going to go and fight the enemy, and they are practicing what David described as the stage three. We must be out to dominate non-Muslims. Now, David seems to like that interpretation, not because he's a Muslim. He's saying, oh, he has more respect for Muhammad than some Muslims, maybe like myself, do, because I'm looking at the statement of Hadith. I'm going to go with that. I'm going with the Quran. David is saying that he has more respect for that saying of Muhammad than I have, because he wants to follow. But my suspicion is that uh, David actually is, is not really more respectful of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, in fact, uh, he is more uh, happy with the fact that there are people like the ISIS group out there who are making Islam look very bad because David is out to minister to and evangelize Muslims and to him it is of great advantage to have people like ISIS. It's uh, we real when somebody dies from a terrorist bombing or killing and, and there are some people who are celebrating, not necessarily David, perhaps not David, uh, some people may be celebrating and thinking, yeah, now we'll, we'll be able to prove to the world that this Islam is really something terrible, leave Islam, come to Christianity, uh, the Bible and, and, and the Christ. But when we look at the matter systematically, even chapter 16, verse number 101, he's citing Al-Wahidi. Do you know when Al-Wahidi was writing? He was writing in the 4th century. So that means more than 300 years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. How does he know that what this verse is referring to as an authority? Yes, we might refer to these scholars, use their studies, but we have to come to our own systematic conclusion after a careful study. And after a careful study, it is clear that even this chapter 16 uh, passage, 
of the Quran is referring to the Quran abrogating previous revelations. Even chapter 16 gives some food laws, and the Jews are naturally complaining. How do we have some food laws, and we were practicing kosher laws for such a long time, and now God sends a new prophet with a new regulation? How could it be a new regulation? This prophet must be, he cannot be a true prophet. So God is saying in response, if we uh, cancel one regulation, we've given you one regulation, that's fine, but if we cancel that now by, and replace it with another revelation, then we are, have the full authority to do that as, as God. And we have the wisdom to know what to give at a certain time. We're giving a new dispensation. In fact, Christians accept that the New Testament abrogates the old. There is a, an old dispensation. There's a new dispensation. Muslims are saying there's a newer dispensation. The Jews said we cannot accept the Christian New, the new Testament, the new dispensation. They rejected Jesus because to them Jesus was coming with something new and rejecting their laws. And uh, the same objection they are now launching to the Prophet Muhammad. But if Christians accept that Jesus can come with something new as a new prophet bringing new revelation, Muslims accept that too. And Muslims say that after Jesus, another prophet came with a final uh, revelation, giving new dispensations and new regulations to people. And uh, so that's what that passage is referring to. It does not prove that some verses of the Quran abrogate some others so that some verses give you peace for the first stage one and some others to tell you about domination for stage three. No, the, all of these verses follow a unified principle that uh, there is justice to be enforced in society. And there is a system of justice to be in place. And that system of justice that is now being introduced and made possible to unify the people will be belief in one God. This is where the verses mention non-belief. Because now it turns out to be a struggle between believers and non-believers. So when the Quran is speaking about fighting the disbelievers, it does not mean that you fight all disbelievers. It means that in that particular context, as Sherman Jackson has uh, uh, written about in, in his article, uh, Jihad in the Modern World, in that context, it was a struggle between two groups. One group was known as the believers. The other group is known as the non-believers. It, it, it does not mean that uh, there should be a continuing struggle between believers and non-believers. There's a struggle between those two groups, and this is, this is how the groups are called. But there's nothing in the Quran that would mean that Muslims have to dominate non-believers. In fact, another uh, academic scholar, Fred Donner, uh, writes, uh, wrote a recent book in which he said that it looks like the, it, the, the, the movement of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was the movement of believers, including Jews and Christians. Not everybody accepts his uh, thesis, and I also have difficulty with, with that thesis. But that, uh, his, the his thesis, the fact that an academic scholar can arrive there, shows that there are passages in the Quran which actually are very favorable towards Jews and, and Christians in particular, and many other believers in God uh, as well. Uh, so it wasn't a struggle between Islam and non-Islam, that Islam has to dominate the others. That Islam was actually struggling for its own existence to stay alive. Non-Muslims were... Uh, hovering over and with allied forces threatening to decimate the entire population. The Muslims had to be defensive and preserve themselves, and they saw the struggle as between believers and non-believers. But it's not essentially a struggle between believers and non-believers. It's the struggle to stay alive. Thank you very much. All right. Well, Shabir says that the commands to fight unbelievers, I'll start at the end there. Uh, Shabir says that the commands to fight unbelievers because, uh, was because there were, there were two groups, believers and unbelievers, but it's not saying to fight unbelievers just because they're unbelievers. Now, I gave the historical context of 929. The Quraysh were wondering how they're going to make money, and then Muhammad receives a command to fight the Jews and the Christians until they pay the jizya as a way of making money. So how exactly, does, how exactly does that historical context or the literary context, keep in mind, we read the entire passage. There was not one word. There was not one word about self-defense in that entire passage. So if that's what Allah really means, couldn't he say one word about this having something to do with self-defense instead of complaining that Christians say that Jesus is the Son of God and that we, we, uh, we try to extinguish the light of Allah with our mouths? Couldn't he put one word in that passage when he calls on Muslims to fight us? I mean, let, let me give an example here. Suppose there's a politician. That politician, after some terrorist attack, comes out and says, we must fight those who believe in Allah. And suppose there's a lot of negative publicity, and then he comes back and says, well, I was only talking about terrorists. Would you say, hey, you need to be a little more clear when you're talking about, when you're talking about fighting people? If you're talking about killing people, you need to be very clear about whom you're talking about here. 
Would we accept if a president of the United States stepped up and said, we must fight those who believe in Allah? And then when he's challenged on, he says, no, I'm just talking about particular people who believe in Allah and were attacking us. That's all I meant. We would never accept that. We would never accept that communication. Why do you say that, that, that you're applying that reasoning to Allah, who claims to be perfectly clear in his commands? Allah says he means exactly what he says. Well, aren't there words for fight in self-defense? Aren't there words for fight people who are attacking you? Why does he say fight those who do not believe? Everything Shabir is saying about what Allah really means, Allah could have said that. Allah could have said it just as clearly as Shabir did, but he didn't. He repeatedly emphasizes fighting unbelievers. And when he says, those who are with Muhammad are severe against disbelievers and merciful among themselves, how could the categories be any more clear here? They couldn't. Now, Shabir says that Muslim writers invented stories to justify their own violence. Um, I have to point out all those sources contain peaceful passages as well. So if they're just trying to justify violence, then why didn't they wipe out the peaceful passages? The only conclusion to draw is that they're trying to do Islamic history as well as they can and that they preserve both. But those peaceful and violent teachings of Islam all fall into the same categories as the peaceful and violent teachings of the Quran. Shabir again says that Silm, me, she says that Silm means peace everywhere it's used in the Quran. Um, as far as I get, that form of Silm right there is used once in the Quran in that verse. We have the historical background. We know the historical, but this isn't how, it, how are we going to uh, interpret this. We know the historical background. The translation, enter completely into peace, makes no sense as a response to, here's a guy who, keeps, who is, continues to keep the Jewish Sabbath. Makes no sense. There's only one interpretation that makes sense, and that's why uh, every respected Muslim commentator that I could find translates it as Islam. And, of course, Shabir seeks, seeks the one who fits that view. But this just doesn't overwhelm the, the historical context and the vast uh, the vast array of Islamic commentators who give the correct meaning. Now, why do Muslims think that certain Quran verses abrogate others? Uh, he complains about me quoting al-Wahidi. I quoted al-Wahidi just because, uh, just for some diversity, because I tend to quote uh, Ibn Abbas and Ibn Kathir, both of whom say that verses of the Quran abrogate other verses of the Quran. Uh, but there's another problem here. Let's look at one of the verses we quoted. Chapter 2, verse 106, whatever communications we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring one better than it or like it. Notice that part. Whatever verses we abrogate or cause to be forgotten. So some things are being caused to be forgotten. Allah will reveal something and then he causes it to be forgotten. Shabir says, well, this is talking about prior revelations. Well, in chapter 87, verses 6 to 7, Allah says specifically to Muhammad. He's talking to Muhammad here. He's not talking about anyone. He's talking to Muhammad. He says, we will make you recite the message so you shall not forget except as Allah wills. So this is Allah talking to Muhammad. Muhammad, we're making you recite the message so you shall not forget except as Allah wills. So Muhammad himself is forgetting things that are revealed to him from Allah when Allah wants him to forget those things. So is this applying to previous revelations? No, it's applying to the revelations to Muhammad. That's according to the Quran. I'm not quoting a commentator there. That's, according, that's Allah saying that Muhammad forgets revelations because Allah wants him to. Now, I said I have uh, more respect for uh, Muhammad. Shabir says, I said I have more respect for Muhammad's sayings than Western Muslims. No, I have more respect for the clarity, for the clarity of Quran verses and quotations from Muhammad, namely that Allah says he means what he says, and that's what we would find with Muhammad as well. And if you wanted to reinterpret them, you, you have to accuse them of being horrible communicators. Uh, he says that, that I actually like ISIS killing people because I, I can use that to win converts. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you heard it here. I love it when ISIS goes around uh, raping their captives and uh, chopping people's heads off and crucifying them and blowing their brains out because I think it will really help me in my ministry work. Now, as far as later Muslims corrupting history, I just have to point this out. Um, once, here again, I have more respect for the integrity of the early Muslim community than Shabir does. When he's rejecting these passages and saying, oh, people made them up, keep in mind, these guys are tracing, them, these guys are tracing their claims back to very early Muslim authorities here. When we talk about abrogation, these are passages that go back to Umar and Uthman, the second and third rightly guided caliph and some of Muhammad's closest companions. Well, they're lying. They're lying when they say that this abrogated that. Uh, someone in the earliest Muslim community must be lying, right? 
if Shabir is serious about this, I have to say he's not very far away from the same argument that is used by people who say Muhammad never existed. People like Robert Spencer, who claim Muhammad may have never, may have never even existed, he basically says that certain Arabs at a certain time realize that they need some uniting figure, and so they invented a bunch of stories, and they invented this figure of Muhammad, who may have been an actual figure, but at least they invented much of his history in order to r rally them, and then so that they could go out and fight and win and conquer. So that's the claim. And what's Shabir saying? Well, all these passages about fighting and subjugating and so on, yes, they're there, but this was later Muslim leaders inventing these passages to justify their own actions. Well, if, they're, if they can invent the history of Muhammad that way, why couldn't they invent a little more so that we can't know anything about Muhammad? Let me put it this way. If the, the earliest generations of Muslims were this big, massive group of deceivers writing things to justify what they're doing, how can we know anything about Islam? By the Quran? The Quran only mentions Muhammad by name four times. Three of those could be a title and not even a name. So we have to go outside the Quran for sources, but if this is nothing but a bunch of liars, my Muslim friends, don't tell me that you know a whole lot about Islam if you're accepting this method. Yes. Okay, so for my five, uh, final uh, concluding statement, folks, uh, you notice that I hesitated earlier to attribute to, to, Dave, to, attribute to David the, um, the feeling that it's good that people are dying because that way he gets to spread his, uh, his uh, evangelizing message. But uh, I was shocked that he came forward and he shamelessly confessed uh, to uh, having that attitude. Um, uh, David, David says that uh, he, he is talking about the historical context, but then to prove that historical context, what does he cite Ibn Kathir? Ibn Kathir died in the year 774. He was writing more than 700 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. How does he know the historical context? Okay, he has reports that go back to some early Muslims. And uh, David is citing early Muslim caliph Omar, for example. Did Omar write anything that you have in your hands today? No. What you have is that somebody in about the third century of Islam writes a book and says that I heard from such and such a person who heard from such and such, who heard from such and such, who heard from such and such, who heard from Omar that he said this. And then that is written down. That's called a, a tradition or a hadith in Arabic. It's related from, by word of mouth from one person to another. And you know how Chinese whispers works. If you relate something and you pass it on, it becomes something else at the end. To be sure, some early Muslim scholars try to be stringent in their methods to weed out uh, the wheat from the sheikh and to pass on good material, but we still have a mixture in our sources between good and bad. We have to sift through them. So what do the non-Muslim historians do? They want to find out who was Muhammad in history. Forget about whether we believe in him to be a man of God or a prophet of God or whatever. We just want to know historically what was that man. And uh, now David is saying, well, if I follow Shabir's method, I would go with Robert Spencer. And, uh, and now it, he shouldn't be associating himself with Robert Spencer because Robert Spencer is known uh, for his, uh, his own uh, way of trying to disprove Islam. That seems to be everything that he's all about. But we should associate ourselves with academic scholars. Why not pick somebody like William Montgomery Watt, who I mentioned previously, who takes a middle position and says, yes, there are things that we cannot trust in the, in the narratives that Muslims compiled many hundreds of years after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But there are some broad outlines that we can trace. And when we trace those broad outlines, as I have done today, and David actually has actually agreed with me on, on at least this aspect, that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, did not uh, fight against the enemy until he had that responsibility to protect. Now, was this his, uh, uh, his, his plan from all uh, from the beginning, to prove that this was the plan in Muhammad's mind, he cited something from uh, a historical book, Tabari. And he was saying, I don't remember if I cited anyone other than Ibn Kathir. Yes, you cited Tabari. And Tabari was writing in the 3rd century or 4th century of Islam. He died in the year 311. Uh, so, uh, 310. Uh, so, the, uh, we are dealing with uh, things compiled hundreds of years later on. That cannot uh, necessarily be uh, taken so, to be so authentic. Uh, so, why didn't he's asking if, if later Muslims invented the idea of a, a warring religion and credited that back to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, why didn't they uh, wipe out the peaceful passages? And then he answered his own question by saying, well, they were historians who just compiled everything, even you know, the ones which were against them. And, and that's, that's what, what I'm saying. 
So he, I'm glad he agreed with that. Uh, it, they were compiling that which was before them, but they were also inserting new stuff. And who is the one who said before me that they inserted the new stuff? I cited Lloyd Rigion. He's not necessarily a Muslim. I don't know what he is, but his name does not immediately sound like he's a Muslim. All I know is that he's an academic scholar who's writing about religions in general. He's written about Islam in particular. His article is there in the book, uh, War and Peace in the World's uh, Religions. So this is what non-Muslims who want to be fair and who do not have an agenda of evangelizing Muslims, this is what they're saying. Uh, this is one view on the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, that, was, he, he, that they, uh, he was made into a warrior figure uh, later on. And in fact, I will say to you that this is what the biblical writers did with Yahweh. They said that Yahweh is a man of war. They made him into a warrior. They made Joshua and others into warriors. Uh, some of the stories, that, some of the horrific genocidal incidents that are mentioned in the book of Joshua. Uh, historians today think that these are not authentic stories. These were made up by Israelites later on when they rewrote their history. Uh, but uh, they made Joshua into a warlike figure. And the Quran, to me, presents Joshua uh, as, as a simple, humble individual, a companion of Moses. And not only Joshua, but Jesus and Abraham and, and Moses and David and Saul. Uh, and, and those figures who cannot be rehabilitated like this were just simply not mentioned in the Quran. Like, uh, for example, uh, Samson, who we know to be the world's uh, first suicide killer because he killed himself and everybody in the arena uh, with him. So the Quran does present a peaceful prophet with a peaceful message. It is a book of peace. Thank you very much. Well, Shabir said I, I shouldn't be citing Robert Spencer. Um, Robert Spencer is a friend of mine. I love Robert Spencer. Um, but I happen to disagree with Robert Spencer on this issue. I actually debated Robert Spencer on whether Muhammad existed. Uh, you can watch that online. But I think Shabir didn't understand the point of bringing that up. My point is that as far as the basic argument goes, Shabir's on the same side with Robert Spencer when it comes to that. By attacking the Muslim sources and pointing out that all of these Muslim sources contain fabrications and that means that we can't trust the Muslim sources. That means we can't trust the people that these sources are being traced back to. It means we don't know anything, right? We don't have a source that we can put our, our hands on and say, this is a reliable source of information about Muhammad. Well, if we have no reliable source of information about Muhammad, that's not very far. That's not very far from what Robert Spencer and others say. That if people later can just invent massive numbers of traditions and stories about Muhammad and, and they can get away with it, that can make them and those, those get passed down to us. If someone can do that, why couldn't they go a little further and just invent Muhammad wholesale? Now, again, I'm not the one saying that. I'm pointing that Shabir is leaning in the direction and that he's only one step away from that. Uh, he says, um, so it, just to sum up here, I guess, is the Quran a book of peace? Well, if you're reading it the way Allah says, he claims to be perfectly clear. He lays down passages on abrogation. I even showed that the Quran showed that he's specifically talking to Muhammad in one of those passages. Well, if that's the case, then you look and you see peaceful verses. You see some verses that call for fighting and self-defense. And you see other verses that specifically say, fight those who do not believe, fight those of the unbelievers who are near to you. If Allah means exactly what he says, then we have to figure out when do certain verses apply? When do others apply? Well, we know the historical background here. We know when the peaceful revelations were revealed. We know when the violent revelations were revealed. The, finding mar the final marching orders are for fighting unbelievers. Now, I pointed out that there are peaceful and violent traditions in the Muslim sources. And Shabir said, well, somehow this shows that they were inserting the violent sources. No, no, I think he missed the point there as well. The point is, if later Muslim scholars and authorities are inventing stories in order to justify violent expansion, why do they include peaceful passages? Why do they include peaceful stories? They could, if they felt free to just invent Islam as they went along, they could have thrown all those out and just, just made Islam violent. So the, the presence of both peaceful and violent passages shows that they're not just coming down for one agenda or the other, but they're actually trying to, they're doing their best to preserve authentic material about Muhammad. If that's the case, you're stuck with the peaceful uh, the peaceful passages and the violent passages. The problem is when we place these into a historical framework, you get the peaceful verses coming early on. You get the violent verses coming as soon as Muhammad is able to violently subjugate unbelievers. Now, Shabir has shown, I think, that the Quran can be a book of peace if you're willing to take certain steps. So if you're willing to declare that Allah isn't as clear as he claims to be, 
if you're willing to declare that the historical context is just unreliable and we can't trust these sources, and we can't really know much about Muhammad because the early generations of Muslims were just a bunch of liars who felt like they could make anything up, even though Muhammad said that the best generations of Muslims are those first three generations. And according to Shabir, those must have been the biggest bunch of liars the world has ever seen, given, all, given the amount of material they produced about Muhammad. So if you're willing to say, well, Muhammad says these are the best generations, but they're actually a bunch of liars. If you're willing to ac uh, accuse this community of being deceivers, if you're willing to declare that Islam's greatest commentators all got it wrong, well, then you can conclude that Islam uh, is a religion of peace and that the Quran is a book of peace. And there are many Muslims, many Muslims who are willing to take those steps. But is that Islam? Allah says what? You must find no, this is in the Quran, he says you must find no resistance against Muhammad's decisions. Where are Muhammad's decisions? The Quran is not Muhammad's decisions. According to Islam, that's the eternal word of Allah. Where do you find Muhammad's decisions to submit to them? The Quran says that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. Chapter 33, verse 21. Where do you find that pattern of conduct? From all of these, all of these works that I'm quoting that Shabir says just aren't reliable. And so you can't even obey the Quran without going to these passages. But when you go to these passages, you find the same things you find in the Quran. Fight those who do not believe. So I would say Islam and Jihad, the Quran and Jihad, stand or fall together. If you reject the Jihad passages, you have to reject the rest. Please join with me in thanking our speakers for tonight's debate.